Dominion theology or Dominionism is a core NAR doctrine. It teaches that God has dominion in heaven, but he has given man dominion on planet earth. That Satan failed to take dominion from God in heaven, so he turned to the earth and took dominion there by stealth, when he deceived Eve and Adam rebelled along with her. Accordingly, Satan became the god of this world, and the kingdoms of this world belong to him. They explained that when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them complete authority over the earth, as in Genesis 1.28 it is written, And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of heaven and over every living thing that swarms upon the earth. In most translations, the Hebrew word radu is rendered have dominion or have rulership, that is, have authority. And so they claim that to take dominion is a command. Cody Archer from Tikkun explains that the first commandment that God gave to man is to take hold of dominion and leadership and to rule and control the earth and thus advance God's kingdom upon it. In Genesis chapter 1, the very first thing that God says to man is to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth and take dominion. Mm -hmm. And in other words, go and take leadership. Go and govern and rule over the earth. This is not something passive. This is God's calling upon mankind to step into place of leadership. Therefore, the first imperative is the giving to man by God complete control over planet earth. Thus they explain a verse in Psalm 116 that the heavens are the Lord's heavens but the earth he has given to the children of men. So according to their interpretation the heavens are God's territory but the earth is ours. This is Miles Munro, Word of Faith teacher and dominionist, explaining in an interview with Benny Hinn that in fact God has no legal right on earth and needs man to provide it for him. The only creature that God gave authority in the earth legally to is a spirit in a dirt body. That means any spirit without a body is illegal on planet earth. Even God himself is illegal on planet earth. But here's the bigger statement. Even God himself is illegal on earth. Why? Because he is a spirit. And the law he set up by his own mouth was that only spirits with bodies can function on earth legally. That's why God could not interfere when Adam and Eve was, you know, kind of de deliberating on the fruit environment. This is the reason why God could not interfere when Adam and Eve were tempted by the forbidden fruit. Mighty, powerful, awesome, omnipotent, omniscient. Why couldn't this mighty God who made 500 million planets and galaxies could not stop a skinny little woman from picking the fruit to destroy his whole program. I mean, come on, God, aren't you powerful? You can intervene, you can destroy the works of the devil, prevent the woman and save humanity. But he couldn't. Not that he didn't, he couldn't. Yes, you heard that correctly. He could not. According to Miles Monroe, when we pray, we are actually giving God legal authority to intervene in the course of events here. Let me define prayer for you in this show. Prayer is man giving God permission or license to interfere in earth's affairs. In other words, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. That's incredible. <laughs> that is in prayer is us granting permission or license to God to interfere. It is the granting of an earthly license for divine involvement in planet Earth's affairs. God could do nothing on earth, nothing has God ever done on earth, without a human giving him access. God cannot do anything whatsoever unless a human being gives him permission. So he's always looking for a man to give him authorization and permission. So he's always looking for that somebody. Always looking for a human to give him power, permission. In other words, God has the power, but you get the permission. God got the authority and the power, but you got the license. So even though God could do anything, he can only do what you permit him to do. God has the power, but we have the permission. Thus, even though God is almighty, in practice he can only do what we permit him to. 
God needs us. We need God. Amen. It's a partnership. Prayer is doing business with God on earth. God needs us, and we need Him. It's a partnership. Doing business with God. Prayer is doing business with God on earth. This is Asha Intrater, President of Tikkun Ministries International and Apostolic Leader of the Revive Israel Apostolic Network. What Asha Intrater says here in Hebrew is similar to the teachings of Miles Monroe. In reference to the Genesis account, where God commands Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, Intrater also claims that God had no right to interfere in such a way in earthly affairs as to send his son to die here. However, he did find a legal way to interfere. In Traitor asserts that God directed Abraham to sacrifice Isaac in order to create a legal precedent so that he could sacrifice his own son. As he already had a covenant with Abraham, he would simply be performing his own part in that covenant, so all would be nice and legal. As under this covenant Abraham was prepared to sacrifice his son, God now had permission to sacrifice his own son. Thus, according to Intrater, God directed Abraham to offer up Isaac with the intent of creating the legal basis that he needed, the precedent and authority that he required, so that he could sacrifice his son. <laughs> Otherwise, Intrita claims, someone could say to God, Who said you could interfere here? Who said that you could sacrifice your son here, God? What is this? You gave planet Earth to mankind. It's a nice plan, God, but it's illegal. However, God could now reply, apparently, Hold on, I've got a friend with whom I have a covenant. It's a full partnership. What he gives, I give. Because he has given his son, then I can also give mine. Intrator also claims that this is the reason why we pray, so that we can partner with God and enable him to act here. He stopped short of explicitly using the Hebrew word for permission, but he does say to allow God to be able to act in this world, which is effectively the same thing. Intrater doesn't see this as violating God's sovereignty. He says that God can come in whenever he wants, but he doesn't violate his covenant that he himself made with Adam, in which he transferred to the human race authority. So technically, God is able to intervene, but it would be a form of trespass and a violation of the covenant with Adam, in which he gave him authority over the earth. This is a messianic Jewish form of dominion theology. If this is the case, then, what did Yeshua achieve during his earthly ministry? Apparently, he regained authority. He then passed this authority on to his disciples and those who believe in him, so that they could take authority over the earth. In fact, 
the Lord's great commission to go out and make disciples is, according to Intrater, a command to take authority. He explains this in his book, Israel, the Church and the Last Days. In a section referring to the Great Commission, Intrater asserts the following. Quote, After Yeshua was raised from the dead, he gave us a commandment to preach and exercise spiritual authority in his name. This great commission is parallel to the great commandment of dominion that God gave us, meaning Adam and Eve, in the first place. God called it dominion in Genesis chapter 1, and Yeshua called it authority in Matthew 28. But dominion and authority are virtually the same thing. Yeshua is referred to as the last Adam. It is as if Yeshua were saying, Look, people, God told you to do something. You didn't do it. Because you didn't do it, you inflicted great harm on yourselves. Now I've fixed you up and given you a second chance. Let's see if we can get it right this time. The game plan is this. Go out and take dominion. Let's try it again. End quote. What Intrater does here makes a significant change to the commandment that Jesus gave his disciples and it turns the gospel in a whole other direction. The original sin caused the loss of dominion, and the Great Commission is turned into a second chance to take dominion. The gospel actually becomes dominion, and that is not at all what the scriptures mean. I think you can already see the problem with this theology. Dominion theology turns us into the strong ones and makes out God to be the weak one. It appeals to human pride, God needs permission from us in order to intervene in this world. He is restricted, restrained and prevented from acting. He is not independent, not sovereign and not omnipotent. He needs to have a pretext so that he can enter this world by the back door because he's lost his right of access here. We are the ones who enable him to enter here and accomplish the work of redemption. When the emphasis in redemption is now being expressed more as redeeming authority over the earth, it's not we who need him desperately. On the contrary, he's somewhat dependent on us. He needs us so that we can triumph over Satan and restore authority. This theology is closely connected with the little God's teaching of the word of faith movement, and it's easy to see why. It turns man into someone God turns to for advice, his partner, his colleague. It turns man, and even Satan, into the sovereigns upon the earth, and assigns to them authority and power that come at the expense of God's power and sovereignty, and his glory and majesty. It panders to man and diminishes God. In fact, the God of dominion theology is not the God of the scriptures, but another God altogether. Dominionism is a sister doctrine of, and often taught along with, word of faith. The belief that by our words we can create reality. After all, when God speaks, he creates reality, he creates by the words of his mouth. So according to the word of faith teaching, by declaring things we also have the power to create by the words of our mouths. All these doctrines turn us into little gods. You can hear the voice of the old serpent seducing Eve. You can be as God. You have power. You have authority. You have dominion. Consequently, this theology is worthy to be called the theology of Satan. It diverts whole churches from the true gospel and leads them to destruction. In sharp contrast to this dominion theology, the picture drawn from the scriptures is altogether different. The understanding from the scriptures has always been that God can do all things, i.e. he is omnipotent. He knows all things, i.e. he is omniscient, and he is everywhere, that is, omnipresent. He is also totally sovereign and totally self-sufficient. That is a bit more of a scriptural theology. The earth is the Lord's and all that therein is, the world and all its inhabitants. Why? For he founded it upon the seas and upon the rivers established it. The logic is that God created everything. And so 
It all belongs to him, and he has complete authority over everything, a prerogative which he exercises to the full. From a great heap of examples we could take how he drowned humanity in the deluge, mixed up the languages at Babel, rained fire and brimstone on the five cities of the plain, clove the Red Sea into two and swallowed up the sons of Korach in the earth. God has no need of our permission. It is written, The Lord does whatsoever he pleases, whether in heaven or on earth, or in the sea or the depths. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be his name. He controls the lives of all men on this planet and every breath they have. He counts the hair on their heads and determines the number of their days. He kills and makes alive. He brings men down to Sheol and raises them up again. Even a tiny bird is under his authority. Are not two birds sold for a penny? Yet not one falls to the ground apart from your father. Satan is certainly the god of this world in terms of its religions, philosophies and cultures. Yet even in those kingdoms which are supposedly Satan's, God does as he pleases. In Daniel it is written, God removes kings and he raises up kings. The Most High rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whosoever he pleases. And the lowest among men he sets them up over it. In other words, even those who seem unworthy to us, are there by his appointment. Nebuchadnezzar had to be humbled as an animal until he understood this principle. And finally he declared that God rules in the kingdom of men, and to whomsoever he wills he gives it. And all the inhabitants of the earth are as nothing, and none can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan king, but even his theological understanding was healthier than that of the dominionists. God gave man the earth with its trees and flowers and rivers, animals, fruits and vegetables, and ideal conditions to sustain life. This is the thing we need to thank God for, and not interpret the Lord gave the earth to mankind through the distorting lens of dominion theology. Consider this, that God is so zealous for his name that he granted victory to wicked King Ahab just because Ahab's enemies said that the Lord is God of the mountains but not of the valleys. Here though, we have people claiming that God has lost his legal rights over all the planet. What on earth? When God said be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, the intention was to multiply and populate the earth. And when it is written rule over the fish of the sea and the fowls of the air and every living thing that swarms on the earth, the intent is authority over the natural world. It speaks of fishes and birds and creeping things, but not of men. Since God cursed the earth, animals do not obey man as in the beginning, though man retains some control over them, which will be fully restored in the millennium. So now to the question, was it a rude interruption by God when he sent his son here? Did he have to get creative or find some pretext in order to enter his world legally? Absolutely and utterly not. Such a thing is defiance against a holy God. It is God's mercy towards us, arising from his goodness and love, that sent his son to die on the cross for us in our place. To contrive this notion that God had to have permission or retroactive power of attorney for his sacrifice is to insult him and spit in his face. Yeshua suffered and died not to redeem a lost dominion but to deliver us from the power of sin and the hands of Satan and from the eternal punishment we deserve in hell. Thus we understand Yeshua's sending out of his disciples. They did not strive for rulership or authority for themselves and they did not teach us to do this in their epistles. On the contrary, they exposed themselves to shame to proclaim the forgiveness of sins and repentance toward God in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. This has been the way the Church has always understood the Great Commission, and this is the way we should always understand it. Brothers and sisters, if God had not intervened without permission in our lives, we would have been lost. So to sum up, what is prayer? It is written, Do not worry, 
but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Note carefully that it says your requests, not your declarations. Prayer, then, is not us granting permission to God to act. Rather, it is the exercising of a privilege God has given us to set forth our requests and appeals for mercy before him. It is important that we acknowledge the centrality of thanksgiving in prayer, in the knowledge that we deserve nothing, that everything is given to us by his grace alone, and we are to submit our will to his. For the dominion belongs to God and will remain his forever. His is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So even though God could do anything, He can only do what you permit Him to do. In other words, God has the power, but you get the permission.